Greetings, Virgin Islanders. I am Lieutenant Governor Trigenzo Roach. COVID-19 continues to be a serious public health threat. Many of us are going about our business as if the disease were a thing of the past. Regular double-digit surges in a number of positive cases tell us otherwise. Too many are disregarding safety protocols, increasing the community spread and putting lives at risk. As a result, there have been required closures in a number of government offices and private businesses. I understand that there is some reluctance regarding the vaccine. I personally took my time and did my research so that I could understand how the vaccine works and why getting it was my best protection. It was the right choice. Please get vaccinated and adhere to the orders set by Governor Albert Bryan Jr and the Department of Health's guidelines regarding mask wearing, social distancing, and proper hygiene protocols. Take your best shot. Get the vaccine. Neighbor, were you able to go shopping for your 10 days of food and water? I can pick up some stuff for you. Yes, I got you, and my neighbor is helping me put up my shutters. Good. Bobby is checking up on his former co-worker who has scoliosis. They got two months prescription from the doctor, so he doesn't run out of medication in the storm. Did you register with Fightrack in the event of needing transportation after or before the storm? You can do that? Yes, if you need assistance around the house or you have a disability. I didn't know that, but thanks for letting me know. It's hurricane season again. Yes. I'm taking these pictures to record your assets. I'm going to email them to you. Where are your documents? We need to secure them. Hi. This is your Senator, Samuel Carrillon. I am proud to be a Virgin Islander, working hard every day to serve you. Because here, we look out for each other. That's why I'm asking you to take Titi Carmen and your Primo Jose to get the COVID vaccine. Some say they may ask too many questions. ¿De dónde viene? ¿Cómo llegaste aquí? But that's not true. Only your name, your age, and your phone number. That's it. No ID needed. Así que por favor, vayan a vacunarse para proteger a nuestra gente y a nuestra comunidad.
to you Virgin Islanders at home and abroad. I hope you're having a fantastic Monday. Today, we are going to give you an update on COVID-19 for the week of June 28, 2021. I have a health commissioner, Commissioner Hustain Encarnacion here with me this afternoon to provide the latest COVID-19 and vaccine data and information on where Virgin Islands residents can get a free COVID-19 test and also, most importantly, get a free vaccine in the territory this week. We are finally seeing some progress in overcoming the most recent surge on the island of St. Thomas, which is fantastic news. Our numbers are starting to approach an acceptable level. Of course, any single case of COVID-19 infection can very well be fatal. So we shouldn't be uh, take down our guard and rest too comfortably on our laurels just yet. This is particularly important as we have recently received confirmation of the AB117 variant. I know there are a lot of these variants and we try to keep up with them, but this is the AB117 that's alive and well in the territory. This is a strain of the virus that is commonly referred to as the UK variant and was the first variant, variant to be verified publicly. So that has made its way to our shore. And I can, uh, I can see clearly that, the large, that a large segment of our population is still behaving as if the pandemic has ended. I was sitting on my porch upstairs yesterday listening to all the people coming back from Buck Island having a wonderful time on the quay and people partying on Saturday night uh, and Friday night. Uh, you know, the, the, the vaccine is here and the COVID is here, so we need to match the two. Um, and we really need to behave like it, it has it because COVID is far from over. I assure you that this is not the, the case in any way, shape or form that we're going to be done with it anytime soon. We still need to practice the basic requirements of social distancing, masking, and hand hygiene. Most importantly, I continue to suggest that the fastest way to put this virus to rest and behind us in the United States Virgin Islands is for every single person to go out there and get a vaccine who can and neutralize this virus. I also want to bring you up to date. Uh, and remind the public that we have our first Vax to Win drawing on July 9th. That's July 9th. If you have at least, if you have at least one shot of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, you are eligible to win $50,000. And if you have two doses of the Pfizer or the Moderna or the Johnson & Johnson, you are eligible to win $100,000. Two winners will be announced every week in um, each district. Uh, one is St. Thomas, St. John District, one in the St. Croix District. We're going to do that every week for 10 solid weeks. So please go out there and get your vaccine. There's no need to register. You're eligible uh, to win. Once vaccinated, you are automatically registered um, for the drawing. Any winners who are under 18 will have their parents um, get that, that vaccine uh, winnings and given to them. It's being run by the VI lottery. The rules and the regulations are there. Um, and we, we put a lot of work into getting this done. So I'd like to thank the commissioner, her team, lottery. But that's not all. We're also having a special drawing for school-based personnel. So if you work on a campus of a public or private school, or parochial school, you can win too. You, this is an additional contest, but this contest you have to register and you have to be fully vaccinated by August 9th. Three winners will be chosen uh, per school district. So there'll be some for St. Thomas, St. John, and some for St. Croix. Third prize is $5,000, second prize $10,000, uh, sorry. Uh, and first prize, of course, is $25 thousand dollars. Unlike Vax to Win drawing, school-based personnel have to register. Now this one you have to register for in order to qualify for this uh, drawing because we have to verify that you're actually school-based personnel. Um, so if you want to register, you have to go online at Vax to Win, V-A-X to Win USVI.com. That's V-A-X to Win USVI.com or call into 777 VAX or 777-8227 or by visiting any one of our 
community vaccination centers or the administrator's office in St. John. Remember, August 9th is gonna be here before you know it, so please, we wanna have a real safe school year and I, we wanna do it in a positive way by encouraging people, teachers, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, office workers. If you've been, you're out there, get vaccinated, get a colleague, put them in the vaccination pool too, and make sure that you get them vaccinated. If you can, parents, if you know if your child is over 12, they qualify, please go out and get their um, vaccination. So they, I, I, before this, I go any further, I wanna break for this and let the commissioner update you on our latest COVID number. Thank you, Governor Bryan. Good afternoon, Virgin Islanders and those visiting our beautiful shores. As of June 26, 2021, the Department of Health has conducted a total of 128,753 tests, of which 3,844 individuals have tested positive and 124,909 have tested negative. There are currently 46 active cases in the territory, 27 on St. Thomas, 19 on St. Croix, and none on St. John. 3,768 cases have recovered with 80 fatalities related to COVID-19. Our current seven-day positivity rate is 1.6. Uh, a week ago, we actually, we were down to 0.87%. So it actually fluctuates based on the number of positive cases that we see. From our hospitals, Governor Wang, F. Louis Hospital Medical Center reports one COVID-19 admission. The Schneider Regional Medical Center reports four COVID-19 admission with one patient on the ventilator. We continue to administer monoclonal antibody treatments to those with COVID-19 who meet the criteria. This medical countermeasure measure has saved many lives and has prevented hospitalization. So far, we have administered 138 doses of monoclonal antibodies to RLS. 48 were conducted in May, 69 thus far in June. 20 total infusions have been administered at JFL. The monoclonal antibodies administered to keep people out of our hospitals, and we have been successful, and bring our COVID-19 numbers down to zero. Last week, we received preliminary results of 17 tests showing the B117 variant, the AB117 variant. Our epidemiology division have now received confirmation from Yale University that all 19 samples from St. Thomas are of the variant B117, the UK variant, as the governor said, which is also the alpha strain. As new positive cases rise amongst unvaccinated individuals, there is a greater chance for the virus to mutate. These mutations can quickly spread across the islands and are known to be more highly contagious. AB117 is estimated to be 40 to 80% more transmissible than the wild type SARS-CoV-2, the original strain. 27 additional samples have been identified as preliminarily positive for the strain. Confirmation is pending this week. Those samples are from cases on St. Thomas and St. Croix. Many have asked about the Delta or B16172 variant. The Delta is more concerning because it is not only more transmissible than the Alpha, but presents more severe symptoms. The Delta is also called the India variant. The COVID-19 vaccine saves lives, and as more people in our community get vaccinated, the chance of the virus mutating lessens. Anyone 12 and older can get the COVID-19 vaccine by walking into any of our community vaccination centers by calling 340-777-8227. Or by scheduling yourself online at COVID-19 USVI forward slash vaccines. Our epidemiology hotline remains open seven days a week from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. or for callers to report suspected cases of COVID-19 at 340-712-6299 or 340-776-1519. We are also still opening pop-up testing. 
You can pre-register for pop-up testing online at covid19usvi.com forward slash testing. Here are other upcoming events. St. Croix at the Charles Howard Complex, Tuesday, June 29th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. St. Croix at the Charles Howard Complex, Thursday, July 1st from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. St. Thomas at the Home Depot from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Again on St. Thomas at Ford Christian Parking Lot on Thursday from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. and that's July 1st. St. Thomas at the Vipa Gravel Yard on Wednesday from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. on June 30th. So, community members, we have some individuals who test quite frequently. Knowing you are COVID negative is great. However, if you do not get vaccinated, that negative test may very well become positive. That said, we also provide access to free COVID-19 vaccines at the pop-up testing sites just mentioned. Thank you to everyone who has made the choice to get vaccinated so far. 44,062 individuals have had at least one dose of a vaccine, which means that about 55.5% of our eligible population that can be vaccinated has had at least one dose. 33,313 individuals are all fully vaccinated, or about 45.7% of our eligible population. Note this, in order to protect from the more transmissible variants, you have to have been fully vaccinated. That is either the Janssen, one dose, or the Moderna and Pfizer, both doses. Some great news, over 650 children, ages 12 to 16, have been vaccinated thus far. If you are a parent or guardian of a child, age 12, 12 and up, please make sure to accompany your child to their vaccination visit and bring an ID for both the minor and the parent or guardian. Not only does being vaccinated keep you safer, but it makes things like, like traveling easier. For vaccinated individuals who are planning to travel to the U.S. Virgin Islands, there are several options. You can upload a negative COVID-19 test or positive COVID-19 antibody test to the travel portal at usvitravelportal.com. News about a vaccine passport. I kind of heard some whisper earlier about the vaccine passport and our, it's basically our digital vaccination record. We have been working with our partners to create a digital vaccination record available to individuals vaccinated here within a territory. We, we went live internally this weekend, which is great news, and have begun our pilot testing, which will be finished on July 2nd. The pilot has actually been We've gotten positive results. Everything is going well. We do apologize for the delay, by keeping your but keeping your information secure is of utmost importance to us. The digital vaccination record will make it easy for individuals to securely share their vaccination status while maintaining their privacy with a growing network of local organizations. We're linking it, not just to travel, but entering businesses throughout the territory as well, or having activities as we look to safely reopen in businesses and resume public events. As we get closer to our launch date, we will send out a press release to share additional details information and the website information as well as a call-in number for those who do not have access to internet. Whether fully vaccinated or not, I am encouraging you once again, as the governor said, to continue to follow our recommendations. Wear your mask and participate in, in all activities at, at a safe distance. Practice good hand hygiene, which means washing your hands frequently with soap and water or utilizing hand sanitizers. Local travel requirements can be found at usviupdate.com. For, for more information on the governor's executive order, visit vi.gov. To keep up with the latest information, please visit the U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Health Facebook page or our website, www.covid19usvi.com. And for COVID-19 health information, also text COVID-19-USVI to 888-777. 
Thank you very much. Governor? Thank you, Commissioner. I think that's fantastic news that we're going to be having uh, the passport, the vaccine passport introduced here in the territory. And we I know we've been working on it a while. So congratulations to you and your team on getting that done. Now, there's been a lot of discussion uh, in the community regarding the COVID-related funding. F this funding is being used for the vaccine incentive is specifically authorized for this purpose by the Biden administration. So they set aside $11 million for us to do vaccine promotion, uh, whether that's lotteries, paying incentives, doing vaccine promo concerts, encouraging and running ads. They set aside the money just for this. So it's not like we're using it for anything else than what it's supposed to be used for. So a lot of the conversation, and I was on the radio this morning about why we didn't do this or why we didn't do that, this is specifically for vaccine promotions. And all of our COVID-related funds received thus far are properly accounted for. Not a single dime has been returned due to any mismanagement on anybody's part. We have already expended considerable funds to address the public health crisis posed by the pandemic. We have opened it. And all these things I want people to understand cost money. I mean, you, you hear us doing these things. They're all money being spent to make you and your family safe. So some of the things we have done. We have opened the community vaccine centers. We have been running PSAs continuously, including this um, program. We have outfitted our children, every single child in the Virgin Islands now, with a laptop and MiFi so that they can have access. We have outfitted our schools with plexiglass and, inter and reinforced internet. We have provided resources to the legislative and the judicial branch. They don't say that and then tell you, but we gave them each a million dollars to spend, much of which isn't expended up to now. And we gave them additional money to the courts in order to make sure that they have jewelry rooms and they have uh, be able to transmit and keep everybody safe when they're having juries. All the electronic equipment, we paid for that too. We put up the travel portal to protect our residents and people coming into the territory. We have assisted the hospitals, not only with their general needs, but we built an entirely new wing in St. Thomas and we built another hospital's uh, remote hospital here in St. Croix at the Na National Guard. The list of expenditures we have done from the beginning of this, from bringing in freezers for vaccines to creating new uh, ways to get oxygen into the territory, by paying for ventilators, by giving scholarships to schools, uh, uh, helping uh, our private schools survive, the university we gave money. Uh, we've been doing things continuously in order to keep the economy afloat and you and your family safe. But we have no shortage. We have no shortage. We don't have shortage of testing material. We don't have any shortage of protective equipment like PPEs, no shortage of hand sanitizer, thermometers, or any of the necessary materials that we need in order to keep people safe. We have been excellent stewards of the COVID dollars as we have been good stewards of all the federal funds entrusted to this government. When we, 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 we have made sure that in this spending too, that we didn't anticipate and spend all our money in the, first, in the first run because we knew COVID wasn't going anywhere. We make sure that we're timing this out so we can address any surges like the one we had in, this, in St. Thomas. The, the truth of the matter is that we are still in the midst of a global pandemic and we really don't know how much longer it will last. It was never our goal to try to expend all of the money all the time mostly because of the way that we've handled COVID. We've been blessed with enough money that we can run our government without adding in additional funds. But we want to make sure that we always have a little nest egg to address any upcoming things that may happen and needs as they arise. I want everybody to listen to me when I say this closely. These funds that we have are available to spend till 2026. That's 22. 23, 24, 25, and 26. We have time in order to use this money and put it to prudent good, because remember now, our budget is really looking good, and we have the general fund monies that we need. 
they all this money that we have it really provides a backstop to traumatic shocks to our economy you know what those traumatic shocks are hurricanes earthquakes and more more recently the pandemic and the closure of the refinery there is no debate that we have managed the pandemic and we have managed the funds effectively. The living proof is a, is a bustling economy that we have right now in all the projects that are continue to go on despite a year and a half of COVID. We continue to abide by every single rule and guidance associated with each part of funds that is allocated to the ter territory. It is clear it is because either the things that we are done we have done are replicated by others or we're replicating what they did now in non-covid uh, covid related news i do have some good news for you uh, as promised our administration is issuing 15 million dollars in income tax returns this week that's 7400 checks that will address refunds for tax year 2018 and for those who have recently filed their 2016 and 2017 income taxes. In addition to this 15 million uh, this week, next week, we're also going to bring another $10 million again in tax refunds, uh, making sure that we do what we promise and pay back the people what we owe, owe them. So, so far, once we issue that, it'll, the Brian and Roach administration have actually issued more than 155 million in tax return, another Virgin Islands record. And not only that, we also paid out. Remember, the states didn't pay out their stimulus. We had to do it as a government. $226 million in stimulus. That's over $400 million added to the economy over the last two years. Um, so we're paying down the long-standing obligations of the government and we're starting to pay what is owed to people for years and years. Even the 8% that there was much debate about last week, we cannot pay the 8% without an appropriation from the legislature. We invite them to join us in paying back the people the money that they owe them. The important thing to note is there is no new funding source. This money is being paid in one year out of this administration's general fund budget. We're paying it out of the budget. Previous people have, have proposed to pay it in two years, in four years. They've established special fund. No such special fund was established for this. We're paying this out of regular money collected. You know why we're doing that? Because we have been good stewards of the people money and we will continue to be so. Other news, we continue to make steady progress on our long-term recovery uh, from Hurricanes Irma and Maria. And last week, we executed the contract for the demolition of the former Evelyn Williams uh, Elementary School in Estate Mount Pleasant on St. Croix. This contract has been awarded to a local contractor, 11 Construction, and clears the way for the construction of a modern, state-of-the-art, brand-new Arthur Richards pre-K through 8 school on that campus. This will be the first school built in accordance with the Department of Education, Educational Facility Master Plan. Y'all remember that? We had to go out and plan how we're gonna build these schools, what they're gonna have in them, what kind of equipment, how many kids are gonna to go to each school, all of that. But better than that, the solicitations for the uh, school demolition um, is complete and that's gone out. But last week, we already sent out the solicitation for the design bill for the new school. So right now, we're soliciting bids for the first school that will be um, delivered in the, in the territory. This will be the first modern school to be built post Hurricanes Irma and Maria. And frankly, since um, we built BCB from the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the last storm that we had, but getting to this point was not easy. It is a daily battle with our federal partners to secure every single dollar we can for our children. We have to go through the process with every single project, the same projects, all 1,600 of them. We have 40 times, 40 times the capital development 
with virtually the same amount of money. So a governor in a good year has 10 million in order to do capital development projects. We have 400 million, 40 times, and we have the same amount of employees. I like to take some time because, you know, I hear a lot of people in the press criticizing the recovery, criticizing our employees, our people. I want to take some time today to thank them. All those hardworking employees that strive in the GBI and in contractors and consultants working to get these programs in place while managing their regular duties and a global pandemic. We appreciate you and the work that you do and continue to do to bring this territory back. We recognize that as an administration, we are constantly challenging you to do more. And we are searching high and low for the support people to come and lend you a hand in order to get this done and rebuild our territory. But if you are out there and you're listening to me and you think you have the expertise to bring to our government, whether it's in construction, management, engineering, architecture, bring your talent, present your qualifications and we'll get you on board. We absolutely need your talent. I've been listening to a lot of uh, rhetoric, a lot of discussion, and some complaints on the radio about why don't we do this instead of this, and why are we taking uh, money and doing a vaccine uh, lottery instead of doing this. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the era of in addition to, not instead of. We're going to ex extend our water distribution system not instead of fixing the sewer lines, we're going to do that too. Not instead of supporting agriculture, we're going to do that too. Not instead of fixing our ailing WAPA system that's giving us so much problems on St. Thomas, but in addition to. Not instead of fixing our schools, but in addition to. Not instead of doing the hospitals, but in addition to. And not instead of doing the roads. All the programs and things that we are launching out, we finally have an opportunity to build the Virgin Islands we've always dreamed of. But we need to be positive. We need to find the talent to roll out these programs. We need to find the people to help us pay the $39 million we have in rental assistance and the $8 million that we have in mortgage assistance. We need to find the people to rebuild the over 300 roofs that we have in the Envision program and do our schools and build, our, build new roadways into our infrastructure. We're looking for those people, people like you, that want to contribute to this territory. Thank you, and I'll, I'll take any questions that you have. Suzanne? Good afternoon, Governor and Commissioner. Good, good afternoon. Thank you for taking our questions. Um, one thing I've been at, asked about by several people is, um, in the portal that we use for traveling and re reporting our COVID testing, um, is the antibody antigen test going to be accepted for people so they don't have to do a COVID test every time they return or leave? The antibody test is actually acceptable and has been for several months yeah. now. Okay. Great. Yeah, we've always accepted the antibody test is valid for four months. Right. Once you get tested, you're, you have to take another antibody test just for the public. The antibody test would be as a result of you either having contracted the COVID virus before or have taken the vaccine. So it's a blood test. If you travel a lot, you can get that. But the new vaccine passport and everything that we're building into the system, once you're vaccinated, you won't need any test. You'll be able to enter um, to, into the territory just by putting your name into the portal, and it'll populate your information. Right. Great. And there's a difference between the antibody if you received the vaccine and if you actually receive antibodies by contracting COVID. So it doesn't last as long if you contracted COVID versus if you've received the vaccine. So even if you've contracted COVID and you recovered from COVID, speak with your physician and become vaccinated. Okay, good. Good to know. And just one more question. Um, anything new and that we need to know about Lime Tree and what's going on there? No, uh, we're waiting on some audits that the EPA had requested Lime Tree to do. They were supposed to get them on Friday. 
Um, we need to circle back and see what those say and how we're going to proceed forward in terms of are they things that they can do within the limits of the time constraints we have with the stop order. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Lasiba. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Lasiba Knight from the St. Gravis. Um, Governor, one thing I wanted to get a quick update on is the rental assistance program. Yeah. I understand that people have been applying en masse. Um, at your Department of Finance uh, nominee was speaking about the robust response to that program. So I was wondering where we are and uh, how much soon that money might get out to the landlords. So we're hoping to get that money out. Our target was the second week in July. Um, it's actually being run by the Housing Finance Authority through some of our nonprofits. So, yeah, we had some, but um, I was looking at the application and it hasn't been that robust a response. We have $39 million. I did the math on the first 21, uh, 21 million we had. That's 26,000 months at $800 a month. And since then, we've added on another 18. So you figure we have probably like 40,000 months at 800 a month. So it's a landlord program, really, even though it assists the tenant. The landlord is the one who the check is cut to. Mm -hmm. um, so we're hoping to have those out by July. We had to build a whole new system in order to um, handle the amount of money that's going through there. So Methodist Outreach is helping us, and we are hoping to get those checks out soon. What were the numbers then uh, for the applications? Say again? How, how, what were the numbers, like, as far as you remember? The last time I heard, I think it was around six and change that we had uh, 600 applications that we had. Okay. But that's minuscule compared to how many months, you know. And, and the thing is, is a lot of these programs that we're putting out there, people are not applying for them, like the school scholarship. You know, if you think you're going to, if, if, if you have the slightest inkling that you might qualify, just apply. You know, the worst they could say is no, but, you know, and remember, it pays your utilities too. I have to go back and um, sit with uh, the Housing Finance Authority because I thought of this weekend about uh, water, paying your water bill. Um, if you have a water truck coming to your house or something, mm -hmm. we should be able to cover that bill because we had a real dry period leading up. It's still a little dry, but we got to figure out if we can pay for that as well. And then um, I wanted to inquire as to your search for a, um, a, a new director for the Water and Power Authority and an update on yesterday's outages because they seemed, um, you know, pretty extreme. Yeah, we, we're still struggling with the old units at the power utility. Um, we, the Wartzillas, which are the new generation uh, generators for St. Thomas, are due to come in this month into the island, so that's positive. Um, and as we keep saying, uh, we have legacy equipment that we're trying to replace as quickly as possible, but they take forever to get them in place and get them running. Not because of any mishap or mismanagement on WAPA's part, but just that's how long it takes to put in. Uh, they're, they're still looking. They have a search. I think they're down to... Uh, interviews now for the CEO for WAPA. I do have a meeting with them last week that was rescheduled. I'm supposed to be meeting with them this week to get an update. In, in those units, I just want um, clarity. That's the four that were federally funded, um, or what the Watsilla units that are coming? The Watsilla units that we have now were, were CDBG purchased, the ones that we're purchasing now. There were some that were paid for before with the gasoline excise tax. Remember, we had to pay for those. Um, but the three that we ordered were out of the CDBG fund. They were the first major purchase out of those CDBG DR funds that we got. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, they, ha they have a delivery time in terms of they have to build the engines and ship them, and then they have installation times once they get here. Uh, I got questions uh, on the phone. Uh, hello, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Yes, um, since the closing of Line 3, I would like to know how has the budget been impacted, if anything? I mean, how much does the budget, how much money do you expect to lose in there since they are not contributing any taxes? Uh, we expect the, the, we expect losses to the budget, yes, but we have the uh, uh, American Recovery Plan make up money, so we're going to be able to sat satisfy any deficit that we run as a result of Lime Tree not operating. Uh, when you do the math on this, Lime Tree has, they give a 90-day notice, so they're up until September 19th. 
So th this fiscal year is essentially done in terms of financing and we feel secure. Going into uh, next fiscal year, we're probably gonna see like a 10 or $20 million drop in revenues um, directly from the plant closing and that could be substituted by money we already have on hand. So no major impact at this point and our, our goal really is, is to figure out how do we get the refinery open again. Do you have any uh, any update on the bond issue? Uh, no, we haven't. We haven't decided to. Uh, we have a, a meeting with the legislature. We're trying to organize. It should be uh, next week, where we'll discuss what their appetite is for going back to the bond market, and if they feel that um, going to uh, the way that we that I proposed originally, putting 85 million dollars in there a year, and then attaching some of the excise taxes in order to create a pension bond opportunity, if that's the way we want to go. We've had a municipal finance meeting with them about two or three weeks ago where we went over all the, the options, and now it's, uh, I think it's uh, time to make a decision. Thank you. You're welcome. Next question. Good afternoon. Hey, um, Ernest, how are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Take off, Chris. Um, a few questions. It doesn't appear as if we've, we've seen too much of an, an uptick there in vaccinations, uh, even since the announcement of the lottery. Right. Can we have an update as to what we've seen? Have we seen an increase that's significant in vaccination since the uh, announcement? Yeah, I, originally when we announced it, we saw a slight uptick. We went from about 100, 120 to 300 vaccines a day. That has slowed. We're currently organizing not only the vaccine structure, but excuse me, but a campaign in order to drive people for that. Once the winners start announcing, uh, we're hoping that we'll get more of a push. But we're in that hard section now where people are just uh, inhibited by taking the vaccine. So we want to do everything we can to get them to take it. Okay, go. Relative to UBI, UBI is for just announcement um, that it was mandatory vaccination for both staff, faculty, and students as well. Um, there are some long challenges whether uh, a school or uh, an institution of higher learning uh, that is publicly funded could mandate vaccination. Um, what are your feelings about that? I mean, as far as I could remember, none of us could actually go to school without having a vaccination card. So as far as institutions being mandate, mandating vaccinations, I don't think that's illegal. I think that's in place in the Virgin Islands. Uh, there are a lot of countries that you have to take certain vaccinations before you're allowed to go there as well, too, in terms of travel. This is not really anything new. Um, the university board has taken a position that they want to make sure that their campus is safe. And they want to remember, they want to make sure that their, their faculty and their students are able to be responsive and come to work, uh, come to learn. So they took that position. Um, and we'll see how that works out. Have the governor got no issues with it? No, uh, you know, I, I um, as much as I try to be uh, transparent and I try to allow people to do their jobs, we put people on that board that have made a decision. Remember, public school, uh, Public schools are not optional. You, you, have, you just have to be in school. The university is not a, it's not, you don't have a right to go to the university. You have, it's a privilege. So they can make those type of decisions and what is best for their faculty and staff and students. Well, but, you know, it's public funded, like right? well, $30 million a year. Um, yeah, so are the schools. Uh, but, We haven't had any of those discussions. Mm -hmm. Okay, no. All right. Um, so that is something you want to discuss, or, or can can uh, parents and guardians expect that you know uh, they're not going to have to? There's not going to be anything mandatory, or is this something that maybe needs to be considered? Immunizations have always been a part of school registration. There is no mandatory requirement to be COVID immunized to go to school, but there are other um, immunizations that they require. So we're not gonna impose a mandatory immunization 
for our employees nor for students. Mm -hmm. You know, sir, I just have a few more questions but quickly. I know you spoke of the, the territory, the government uh, basically seen about twenty million dollars in last last revenue come next come next year. Um, this fiscal year is basically complete. You're we're good with that. You're speaking of government operation, however, and and how you know any drop of revenue may be buffeted by uh, uh, the monies we're seeing from the rescue act, but. What about the real life implications of, of the hundreds of employees uh, being let go by the refinery and its contractors? What is the administration's plan there? So uh, I personally went about speaking to certain individuals, and some would contend that, you know, we are losing jobs paying uh, 50, 60, 70, 80,000 um, dollars annually, middle class or middle class folks who will be made redundant. What is the administration's plan there to really? work especially with the Senegal community and see how that could be mitigated somehow. What are the opportunities? What is the next course of action? Is the administration going to petition the, the, the President of the United States? What, uh, what are the strategies being considered at this moment? What would the President of the United States do? He can't do a damn thing about the refinery being shut down because it's more than an EPA issue. It's a, it's a funding issue. Uh, what is the administration doing? Well, first and foremost, uh, you know, our conversations with the investors who are on board is how do we keep the refinery open? Uh, we're constantly working with the EPA to make sure that we can open safely. And then we're looking at new investors and bringing some money to the refinery to make sure that it can keep going. Further than that, we have over $30 million that we're uh, guaranteeing to the uh, Catalyst Fund, which will help new businesses do gap financing that want to come here, uh, corporations and the like. Uh, as recently as last week, we had conversations with Tropical. Um, and as we push forward our regional agenda in the Caribbean, what we want to do is make the Virgin Islands a pivotal part of transportation. Um, those conversations with them included applying for a $60 million grant on St. Croix to reinforce the ports. And of course, the $23 million grant that we have on St. Thomas that is going to help us bolster our transshipment. Shipment. We are also dedicating um, $10 million towards farming, uh, doing farming support in terms of the farmer of supplying water uh, in places like Bordeaux, and also supplying uh, funding money so that they can widen their crop growth and base. We are bringing on the agricultural incubator um, in St. Croix. That project is going to be working with the farmers in action and try to get a place where we can not only learn about how to better um, do agriculture, a, a, a community kitchen for uh, secondary goods that need to be processed. We're also looking at it, expanding our tech sector. Uh, we've done a considerable, a lot of considerable work with the accelerator program at the RT Park. We've also invested some money into doing uh, the broadening of our EDC as well as our RT Park advertising for new companies coming to the territory. Our marine sector is currently booming, and we need to be able to create a workforce for that. Um, on St. Croix, uh, actually in the Virgin Islands, we've de dedicated over $10 million to putting people into work and giving them work experiences where they can learn. Now, there's more money there for that. Most crucial to our um, being able to be resilient against what's happening at the refinery, I've met with my commissioners and asked them to fast track the St. Croix project so we can get them into production and we can get construction going, which will help to keep our uh, flow of transportation, goods, and all of that stuff coming to St. Croix, and at the same time give people jobs and allow them to work in another sector. Uh, it's, it's not going to be easy, but certainly I'm not all doom and gloom. I look at this as another challenge for our administration, just like we did with the pandemic. We'll prove out and show that we can manage the situation, put people to work, and keep our economy flowing. Well, thanks. I have one more question, but I want, I want to follow up on this quickly. You said the conversations being had right now uh, are relative to how can, um, you know, uh, how can we uh, start, restart refining? Can you give us more, some more insight on that, please? Because, again, the refinery has um, shut down. Let, let them go in for on September 19th. They, they said they've had struggles with, uh, struggles with um, uh, investors who don't feel the climate is right, you know, a, a, a shutdown refinery, you know, um, all the factors playing into that. 
what you mentioned is that the idea here, the discussions are related to how do we get the science back online. Can you give some more insight on that so folks could get an understanding of what exactly that means? So you have a totally different situation that you have in 2012. In 2012, you had a refinery that had $500 million of EPA adjustments that they had to do in order to come into compliance, much less run. In 2021, where we are now, you have $2 billion of investment by private investors to essentially produce what we could call a new refinery. Um, so it's, it's, it's brand new, it's ready to go. They've already invested the money. What their hurdle is now is the EPA. Uh, I think there's a feeling by investors that the Biden administration is not uh, uh, pro-industrial uh, business and oil business, and they're hesitant to put in more money because they don't know what are the other ramifications um, that will happen as the EPA moves forward. And then two, uh, investors who want to make sure that, that, that the refinery can meet some of their deadlines that are imminent. Um, so the, I think there's a lot of uh, interest in the refinery. Uh, and there's a lot of money that put, been put in it, and people don't walk away from a $2 billion investment with trying to get uh, some of their money out of there. Uh, as of now, the, the other important thing to recognize with this refinery is they have contracts in place. I'm killing the translator lady who's um, doing this in hearing impaired. I'll slow down. <laughs> <laughs> I see her hustling. Um, we also have, they also have a contracts in place with BP at this point. So they have a customer to sell their product. They just need to get the refinery up and prove that it can produce oil in a safe way um, like they were doing prior to those emissions um, problems. I I'll keep it there. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I would appreciate it. You know, when uh, the, all the, the, the writers about this, I try to always keep a positive uh, approach to the closure of the refinery. We, we've closed down before. We know the traumatic um, consequences of the refinery closing. But we're in a different space. Uh, we have the ability now to know what goes on and to react better to the closure of the refinery, as well as to make the investments where we know we will get the most bang for our buck. Our tourism sector in St. Croix needs a little bolstering. We're going to add some money and support around that as well, too, and make sure that even though we're closing down on one place, we're opening the doors on many other opportunities to diversify our economy and keep our uh, island territory running. I think that's it. Be safe, be sanitized. Love you. Have a fantastic Monday.